This morning, our solution series, I think, is on one of the most important topics we should be talking about and doesn't get enough talking about. Uh, given all the stats we can all talk about when it comes down to substance abuse or mental health issues, it's the impact on businesses that I think is so important. My day job is working on the investment industry, so I work with business owners when they're putting together formal case or other HR programs for their clients or for their employees. But a question I get all the time is, how do I find, how do I keep great employees? So this morning, having an opportunity to hear from some specialists about what it means to care for that employee while still trying to care for the business and keeping it successful, I think is really important. Uh, so this morning, I'll turn it over to Lori in a minute to introduce our, our panel, who I've, I'm, I'm very excited to be with this morning. Uh, but before I do, I also want to mention one more thing. For those of you who do know Granite Pathways, we started six years ago as a peer support community providing a clubhouse model to our members in Manchester. I'm very excited to say that we are committed to reopening that clubhouse in Manchester in 2017. Anne Strachan is our director of mental health services for Granite Pathways. It's her job, and I'm going to be working with her, as all of our board will be, to help make sure that we're up and running again before the end of 2017. We're very excited. If you're unfamiliar with the clubhouse model and how it works, uh, we are there to engage our members, get them back focused on their longer term goals, whether that is employment, like our today's discussion, or if it's more about housing, or if it's more about their education, but really ending that isolation and getting them back involved in the things that make them who they are, and not just the diagnosis that tells them what they can't be. But let me introduce Lori Lutz. Lori's going to be our moderator today. She's our chief strategist for FedCap in New England. She's been a great help for us in Granite Pathways, helping us not just transition from Granite Pathways alone, but into our partnership with FedCap and really helping us strategize as we move forward. So I'm, I'm very glad you're here today. She's going to be our moderator, so let me turn it over to Lori. I am, um, I am deeply honored to introduce our panel. You know, when you um, prepare for these, and this happens to be FedCap's 14th solution series. We started these in 2010, and um, each time the topic is one that is real germane to business. We've talked about the impact of the increase in minimum wage. We've talked about the impact of immigration. We've talked about the intersection of workforce development and economic development. We've talked about hiring um, previously incarcerated. Hiring vets, the topics have been varied. Each time in preparing for it, I get to meet experts. And I have to tell you that this panel is probably one of my favorite. Um, there's a passion that you're going to see in each of these gentlemen. There's also a knowledge base that's extensive. So let me start with John Burns. John actually is a recent member of the Granite Pathways family. Um, and although we're sad that he left us, John came to us as the director of the um, Safe Harbor Recovery Center after having actually launched Families Hoping and Coping, which has um, different um, organizations throughout New Hampshire, you'll not only notice John's passion about the topic, <clears throat> but you'll notice his personal experience. John comes to us um, and he'll tell his own story with an experience and I think a reflection on business that um, is really important and, and profound. John recently, as I said, left and now he is, and I have to read it because he got to create his own title, so it's seven miles long. It is a, he is the Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships for Public Health at Goodwin Community Health Center. So, welcome, John. I got to see his business card around that one. So, um, when I first met Rob Roy, I didn't have any idea that there was sub-C communications. So I have learned so much about subcom. It's actually, the title of the company is TE Connectivity Subcom. It's no located in Newington, New Hampshire, so they had a lovely drive over this morning. Yes. Rob has lots of roles that he carries out. One of them is the Environmental Health and Safety Manager. Another one, which is more recent, is the Facility Security Officer. Another one is the TEOA leader, TEOA, yep. yeah, he'll tell us what that means. Um, and more important, Rob's been with the company for 30 years. He's watched it grow from a small company to a very large company, and therefore hiring and retention is a huge deal, especially in New Hampshire, which has a very low unemployment rate. So he'll talk about the impact of mental health issues and substance use disorders on um, the 
retention, hiring and retention of quality um, employees. So Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. And last but not least, we have Chris Placey. He is the Executive Vice President of a Substance-Free Workplace. And um, I felt like I was in a classroom as a student with Chris. He, um, he has a wealth of information, has a, just a really exciting and compelling way of sharing that information. You'll experience that as he speaks. I think he's a founder and one of the main trainers in um, his organization. Many of the businesses that are in the room today, and there are quite a few, are here because of their relationship with Chris. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I'm going to thank you, everyone. Thank you. So let's just give a little bit of a tee up to the conversation, and then I'm going to start by asking um, Chris to do some introductory comments about the way that he thinks about the role of business in um, prevention, intervention, and retention, and we'll talk about that more as we dig forward. One of the things that we know, and research bears this out over and over again, that there is a direct correlation between the stability of employment and long-term recovery. In, in FedCap, we use this phrase, work completes treatment. And we really mean that about our work. We really believe that work is essential to a, a life of, I think, health and recovery. The thing that happens, and these gentlemen will talk about this in, in great detail, is that if I as an individual start to struggle, maybe with depression, maybe I'm misusing some form of a uh, prescription drug, and I think something's wrong, the last place in most instances that I want to go to is my employer. The last person I want to know it or see it is my supervisor, which means that I'm probably not talking to folks in the place that I spend most of my time. And the danger for that is that isolation kicks in and it's a vicious cycle. And one of the things and one of the, the issues that we know is stigma is great as it relates to mental illness and addiction. And self-stigma, self-punishing, probably is greater. And yet, in the absence of talking to somebody about it, in the absence of uh, getting help, one of the things that we're gonna talk about is the high, high disability rates and the dip in productivity. The number one area of employee engagement is that the senior, that, that the employees trust that senior leaders are fundamentally invested in their well-being. They care whether or not their health is in good shape. Their mental health is in good shape. And so this conversation has to do with the direct correlation between our investment as business in our employees and productivity. So with Chris, with that kind of a tee up, if you couldn't, if you wouldn't mind giving us kind of an orientation as your work has really, um, I think, launched a lot of this learning about the perspective of, the, of business in actually the prevention of um, substance use disorder, specifically just the role of business in this whole topic. Yeah, uh, thank you all for being here. I, I, this is great and I love this topic. <laughs> um, I think that businesses are a great entry point for prevention, intervention, treatment, and, and recovery as well. Uh, I think that uh, over time, we've changed a lot how we are approaching uh, people with mental health or substance use disorders. In fact, in the last two years, as all of you know who are in the field, boy, a lot's changed. Uh, if you look at law enforcement, for example, law enforcement ha had you know the war on drugs and they went out and they operated in a certain form or fashion. And in the last couple of years, they've realized, well, wait a minute, we're not really being productive in what we're trying to accomplish. We need to rethink how we uh, do our work. In fact, I worked with several police departments and to change how they thought, and meaning uh, <coughs> engaging people from a caring, compassionate standpoint and not just reacting to the symptoms of, of the disease of addiction or mental health disorders, but actually help them with the issues that they actually have. So they're changing the way they operate. Healthcare, healthcare, and just, just the research will show you that there's a significant uh, reduction in the amount of prescriptions that they're prescribing. They're realizing we need to do things differently because the way we were doing it before, you know, hasn't been working. 
I, I segue that to, to business, that uh, this, the solution to all of these problems is going to take a comprehensive approach, meaning law enforcement, health care, parents, community, and business. I think business is the one that we're trying to, to get up to speed, and we need to rethink how we uh, think about this topic and how we do business. Uh, businesses are in a unique situation where they have something on the people that they employ, meaning that they can uh, change the culture so that their culture of their business is one that, as, as Lori talked about, that we care about you as a person first. This isn't, the, the big mistake that businesses make is that they hire somebody to do drug testing. What does that mean? What does it accomplish? If, if you don't have a policy, if you haven't trained supervisors to recognize and address early on when somebody's developing an issue, even before it's a substance abuse issue, and addressing that, if you haven't trained your staff to understand why it's in their best interest that you're doing this, it's, it's all gonna be for nothing. If you don't utilize your EAP program for what it's for, meaning the EAP program isn't there designed that, okay, I know Rob's got a problem now, so let's send him to the EAP program. It's actually designed to say, gee, Rob, I can see some things going on in your life that could lead to a problem, so why don't you do this to prevent that from happening? And then ultimately, yes, there has to be drug testing put into place um, so that uh, you verify uh, that people are, are following what your policy actually say. Thanks, Chris. So, Rob, you come to us <coughs> representing a business, and I think it's um, there's a lot of talk about let's not lay any more costs on business. So I'm really curious to know what you think about the um, idea, the premise that Chris has laid out that business has a role in the in the in the whole area of prevention and intervention. Could you speak to that? Yep. Thank you, Lynn. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I was fortunate in, in our business model um, to know Chris professionally through a different operation where both basketball officials with the state of New Hampshire. And uh, so I kind of got an exposure to his program. He knew what I did at work. We did a lot of talking behind the scenes that kind of set the foundation of where, where we formed our business direction. Um, we spent you know, we've taken our organization in the last year and a half, we've, we've grown our organization from 250 employees to 850 employees. So um, we had a big influx of new, new hire, all right? So we had a lot of challenges in training, a lot of challenges in how do we get that many people in the Seacoast area um, when unemployment rate is as low as it is in the state um, to, to, to come to our employment. Um, and so we face a number of challenges there. And as we started to bring that influx of employees in, some of the things that Chris and I had talked about behind the scenes became really more um, evident. We started, we saw some examples of the opiate crisis and how it's, it's hit us in business. Um, we had two employees OD at work. Um, one of our supervisors found an employee in the bathroom. Um, and fortunately for this supervisor, his training, it, you know, he, he felt something wasn't right. He, he, he followed up with that person when, you know, right at the start of shift, went immediately to the bathroom, didn't come out, went in, found the employee unconscious on the floor, um, literally saved his life. Um, the EMTs revived the employee, and, uh, um, and, and so it was, it was a significant event for us. And then that's when Chris and I started to kind of change our strategy. We had an EAP program, um, and a lot of organizations have it, but they kind of look at it like a check in the box. We have an EAP program, but if you ask the question to a supervisor, what's the company that runs it? What's the telephone number? How do, how do they access it? Um, usually the answer is, well, we send them to HR. Um, and what ends up happening there is, is then the employee looks at it and says, well, my supervisor really doesn't understand it, so is it really a value? Um, and so we spend a lot of time in training with our supervisors, how to, specifically what can the EAP program provide? I mean, it's not just about drugs and alcohol, it's, it's financial, it's divorce, it's anything that brings that stress to an employee in the workplace. Um, and because the super, we're a 24 hour, seven day a week operation. Um, we're at 100% capacity, um, so we are extremely busy. Um, we work a odd manufacturing schedule, we work 12 hour shifts, four days on, four days off. So literally we have employees that come in at 7 p.m., leave at 7 a.m. 
they don't see the, the majority of the, manu the uh, management. Um, they see their supervisor. That's their one solid base. Um, and that's what we put all of our focus on as far as the training and resources is with our supervisors. Um, and Chris's approach from a, the care and compassion angle is what we really focus on with our supervisors. Um, because what, what tends to happen is, is if, if you can deal in real factual things that you see in an everyday observation, attendance issues, um, you know, pro productivity stuff that you can tie to realistic numbers, you can have a meaningful conversation with an employee and never talk about drugs and alcohol. You can open the door to say, geez, you know, Fridays it is a tough day. You know, your productivity is off, your scrap reject is off, whatever that particular key factor is, you bring that fact, it's not disputable. You're not gonna have an argument out over it. It's not like I say to Chris, hey, you know, you're late on occasion. He says, well, Joe's late more than I am, so why would you be talking to me? Um, but, but actually get it to a quantitative number. Hey, I notice on Fridays, your, your scrap yields up 10%. You know, you have, you know, what do you think's the contributor? And then be quiet. Wait for the employees to, because many, many times, and our supervisors have told this a number of times, where they open the door, they, they ask the question, and then they wait, put that awkward silence out there. They get a lot of information back. And a lot of times, employees are looking to make a change. They're just not exactly sure how to make the connection. Um, so, and well, just one thing I wanted to um, have you just talk about a little bit is you've instituted a pretty, um, I would say, rigorous drug testing. And, and you actually have a one and out policy. That's our corporate policy. That's a corporate yes. policy. Yeah. Um, the, I, I, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I did want you, um, in our conversation, you said if businesses are gonna do that, they better be prepared for the results. Yeah, and and was, I thought that was an interesting statement. <laughs> well, um, when Chris and I set up to do our first, when we started coordinating when we were gonna do our first random, Many employers use pre-employment screening as their mechanism. Pre-employment screening is not gonna do, it's not gonna capture what you need to capture. If, if, if I tell you two weeks from now you're gonna take a test to get your employment status, um, the vast majority of employees will be able to abstain long enough or figure out a mechanism to circumvent the test. Um, but when you random screen on site with a mobile test site where you take a test group, you put them in a, a closed room, and you say you stay here until the test is complete. Um, if you refuse the test, it's an automatic discharge. Um, so it's a mandatory type situation. Um, and Chris said to us, the first time that we did it, because he knew we had done a lot of hiring, he said, are you ready for the results? And we were kind of like, well, yeah, that's why we called you, right? I mean, of course we're ready for the results, right? But that first night, that first screening group, when we took about 35 individuals out as, as what we would call false negative from the initial test, um, that really, I mean, we closed the manufacturing department. We took an entire shift of employees out of the workforce. Um, and it was like, then we, then we really started to focus at it to say, Wait a minute, you know, what we're doing on the front end, the screen coming in, is not doing it. It's, you know, then we had the two, the two overdoses, um, you know, so there were, it was very overwhelming. Thank you. Yeah. So Rob's giving us the, the boots on the ground experience, and John um, comes at it from a slightly different angle. And so John, as a person both in recovery and as a father of a young daughter in recovery, what do you look for? What are the key elements in a business environment that you think produces loyal and productive employees? So I, I think the key element is, is policies and procedures that are in the workplace that are not only um, supportive, but that are what I call recovery friendly. And that is that it's, it's great to have a policy. It's, it's, and all of that and have those controls in place but if the employees don't know that it's a supportive environment then it doesn't help them because of the shame and the stigma um, and I think when you have that when you when you have what I refer to as a recovery friendly workplace um, people are going to get the support they need rather than try to hide from it which typically is is what you see in the workforce and that was my own experience um, both as an individual and as a family member so you're going to get higher performance out of individuals 
it's going to lower costs with turnover and issues of that nature that relate to the employment side as, as an employer. Um, from my personal experience um, as a person long-term recovery, uh, my first go round with it, I, I essentially didn't use any recovery support. So I, for lack of a better term, white knuckled it and abstained and kept myself really busy and um, was sober pretty early on, but went four years in recovery with that approach, not really realizing there was recovery supports, not really realizing there was a recovery community. And four years into my recovery, went to a party over a holiday weekend and the train came off the tracks and essentially didn't go to work for, and I, and I'd worked my way up into from an entry level position into a supervisory role where I was and basically went four to five days with just woke up one day and was like, Oh boy. You know, I didn't know where my car was. I didn't know I hadn't been to work for, you know, it had been a long <coughs> weekend, so I hadn't been to work in three days. I hadn't called anybody. Um, and somehow, uh, be, living that lifestyle was really smooth, apparently, and how I got myself out of that, and I was able to maintain employment. But it, it came with, you know, it came with an empty bank account, and all of a sudden, four years down the drain, um, and there was no recovery supports around me, and no recovery supports in the workplace. So that was kind of my first experience, and, and then had similar experiences as a family member, which we can get into in a little bit too. Thanks, John. So Chris. Giving that as the foundation, there's a new lexicon that's entered the um, environment. The term is called presenteeism. It's actually defined as an illness-related reduction in work productivity. Basically, I'm the working wounded. I'm there, but I'm barely there. It's interesting, the 2013 research of EAP programs tells us that among all productivity losses, 81% is due to presenteeism related to mental health, and substance use disorders. Chris, what's your reaction to this? We had a great conversation about this. Yeah, there, I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, lots of businesses, I mean, what business owner wants to go up to one of their staff members and say, you know, I want to discuss uh, your drug or alcohol use issues. And that's a scary thing. So uh, our approach is totally different than that. But as far as the presenteeism, you, you can also look at the other group of people, which is the family members who are at work and their loved one at home has a substance use disorder that they may be worried about. Uh, not to mention any other mental health issues that they might be having. So they're at work, but they're not uh, you know, at 100% focused on what their job is, and that causes, uh, costs businesses a lot of money. Um, Brian Gottlob, which I'm sure a lot of you know about the Polycon study, uh, found out that uh, in 2012, when we only had 163 overdose deaths, the, the economic impact of drugs and alcohol on, on the state of New Hampshire was $1.84 billion. He's actually updated that to about two, I think somewhere around $2.2 .2 billion. Uh, and about 60% of that is absorbed by businesses. And a lot of that is uh, from absenteeism, uh, presentism, presenteeism, uh, however you want to say that. Um, and he, here's, I want to build on my first comment. Um, I said that businesses were great access to prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery. When I work in this field, of, and my expertise more is in prevention, but I, I look at it like, okay, we're trying to help people who have a substance use disorder or a mental health issue. So the, the best way you can uh, you know, help with that issue is one, you gotta go to where they are <laughs> and figure out where the biggest economic cost is. So it doesn't make sense to me uh, in, in all due respect for all the strategies that we've tried, that we don't have a strategy where we don't go to businesses, seeing how businesses are absorbing the largest economic cost of this issue from any other sector. And also, one thing that people don't realize is that of all the people who have a <coughs> diagnosable substance use disorder, of all of those people, 76% of them have one thing in common they have a full or part-time job. So my point is, if you want to help people with substance use disorders, <coughs> most of them are in the workplace. So it makes sense to have a care and compassionate standpoint where, uh, you know, uh, to, to comment also on um, what John said, 
from a business perspective, I never recommend to a business that they fire an employee who fails a drug test. Because to me, it makes absolutely zero sense. And also, it doesn't make dollars and cents because it's a huge economic cost for you to, you train somebody, you hired them, you, you must have thought they were a good employee because you hired them, and now all of a sudden you've got to go find somebody else. And who are, what's the pool we're drawing from? Rob and I talk about this all the time. <laughs> You know, uh, the, the, the employees out there that he's drawing from at a 2% unemployment rate, and, and a lot of those can't pass a drug, uh, on a, a pre-employment drug test, so, so where are you at? So, yes, I, you know, I, I think the, it's an economic cost for businesses. There are a lot of employees who have substitute orders in the workplace. If you have a caring, compassionate strategy that is comprehensive and has uh, both policy, supervisor training, employee training, um, EAP program, and drug testing, you can have a huge impact in a positive way and maintain the employee that you had that was a good employee before when you hired them. Chris, you actually talked about both the Navy and construction's return on investment. I thought those were amazing statistics. Y yeah, the Navy did a study and they, they found that for every dollar they spend on uh, substance-free workplace, they actually return about $10. If you look in the private sector in construction where the usage rates are about 17%, uh, that'll, the return on investment will be about $20. I mean, the way I also look at it, it's a win-win-win situation, meaning if you treat your employees this way, it's good for the employee as a person because you care about them. It's a win for the business because they're actually going to be more productive and more um, uh, profitable and it's also a win for a community because you're helping solve a very significant uh, public health issue. I love it. Thanks so much Chris. So Rob, what do you see as the impact in your day-to-day -day business? And there's there's financial implications, there's um, general I think market presence imp imp implications. If you could talk a little bit about those, the, the raw numbers that defend the position that you're taking. Yeah, um, you know, there's a there's a few factors there. Um, number one, when we look at from a care and compassion standpoint, we're trying to when we started our whole process, um, the first couple of screenings that we did, we had about a thirty percent failure rate in the employee base that we had, based on all the all the vast number of employees that we brought in <coughs> in a very short window. Um, so. We had to change, number one, our, our philosophy on how do we get in front of it? How do we get that communication out? One of, one of the mechanisms that we found was is that we needed to break our random screening up into more periodic events. more Not so that you could predict when they were going to happen, but predictable that all the employees understand that a percentage of the, staff, a percentage of the workforce is going to be randomly screened on a monthly basis, and it's aggressive. Yeah, our policy our corporate policy is one and done. So you test positive, there's no, there's no second chance opportunity. Number one one's making sure that everybody understands that when they walk through the door. Um, but also educating them on all the resources that we have. And we, we saw it after the first couple of random screenings where employees came to us and said, I need some help. Um, I like this work, I like this job, but I'm, you're, I'm gonna get caught up in this random screen and I need to make a change and I just don't know exactly how to facilitate that. So how do I get at EAP? What are my options? Um, so we saw some of that um, coming in. Obviously there are employees that if they're not willing to look at the issue that they, they will get caught in a random and that's, that's tragic because if you look at training costs in general, you know, for us, um, a heavy manufacturer, the training investment, we're calculating about eight or nine thousand dollars an employee roughly um, of time and commitment that we're putting in to all of our safety programs <coughs> new employee orientation which is a two-day process with multiple staff members and then on the job training from there our goal <coughs> is to make sure that when Chris comes to work every day the person that's next to them is in high or under the influence that's going to affect his ability to do his job um, and from that standpoint, then that's how we look at it from a policing standpoint to say, we have to talk about our concerns, we have to address issues. Um, that's where we focus with our supervisors. Um, many of these, when you're working 12 hour night shift, um, four consecutive days, I, 
I would challenge that the supervisor sees these employees more than their significant others because they work a night shift. They know this person. They know when they're on their A game. They know when they're off. Um, and when they're off, that's when we have to have conversations. Maybe nothing more than, you know, the kids were up all day and I didn't sleep great today. Okay. But you know what? At least you know that I was acknowledging the fact that I'm concerned. I see something different and we're having a conversation about it. It's easy to have this conversation. It's not punitive. Um, and in some instances, then you get to the root of an issue that you can deal with before it becomes a random screen and now you've lost that. You've lost that investment. So John, as your daughter started to struggle, and John will talk about that a little bit, here he is, a regional sales manager, supervising hundreds, maybe more than that, and yet you're concerned about the well-being of your daughter, and you'll talk about that. Why did you keep it from your employer? So at, at this point, um, I was, like Lori said, I was in a regional sales management position, and I covered the whole Northeast um, in, in a, um, a, basically an executive level sales management position. And to me, it was, you know, part of it was, it was, I looked at it as personal business, and, and my role was essentially training sales managers and their sales representatives in the field most of the time. Um, so I was in a role where I was teaching these people their careers, essentially, um, with them in their vehicles. So to get into my personal life and, and talk about this, A, there's the, the stigma piece, um, but at, at that time, you know, my first experience with this was that I was, um, my daughter was at that time not struggling with substance use disorder. Um, really, it was mostly mental health and she had some pretty significant mental health issues. Um, and I was traveling. So I was traveling anywhere from Maine to Washington, D.C. or out to Buffalo. And she would, you know, I'd be out with people and she had a suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. She had a couple suicide threats. She was hospitalized um, two or three times. And most of the time I was traveling and I was traveling Sundays through Thursdays trying to coordinate how to get her admitted into a hospital for a suicide attempt and talking to her mother and talking to insurance companies all the while um, sitting alongside employees and other sales managers that were working for me trying to hide this um, because of the fear of I didn't want to compromise my employment discussing this with employees or or my CEO at the time. Um, so in, in one particular place, in one particular situation, she had actually attempted suicide and was hospitalized and I got a call from her mother and I was working in New York City and, was, um, and it happened just as I was finishing the shift and I was in a hotel room. I had flown to New York City, I had a return flight in two days and I had a rental car and her mother called me and said that we're on our way to the emergency room, she attempted suicide. And, and so, actually it went to such lengths to hide it that I took the rental car, drove back from New York City and New Hampshire to New Hampshire to meet them at the hospital five hours later and canceled my return flight. And I was terrified that, you know, and I returned the rental car, I paid for it out of pocket rather than charging the company. And, and I was terrified that our travel department would see that I didn't take the return flight and somehow find out that I had called in sick the next day and driven all the way from New York City to New Hampshire just to care for my daughter because of that stigma, because of not realizing that they might have been supportive. It ended up being misplaced because that CEO I later did disclose what was going on and had to, and he was super supportive with me. Um, but it was, you know, it was obviously being in those situations that went on for years, it was pretty difficult to be concentrating on what was in front of me for a career as well as trying to deal with some of the issues that you have with substance use and mental health issues when you have a family member. And I think that's often forgotten by employers as we look at the individuals um, when, you know, in addition to the numbers Chris had said with individuals, we have all the family members of those individuals. So, you know, it's it's prevalent throughout the workplace and sometimes that impact can be just as great on a family member. When we, when we became more aggressive in our random screening, the first couple of events, there were some names on the list that came up that lost their employment, 30 year employees. Um, got, I, I've worked at this organization for 30 years and um, the business is fascinating. It really attracts people that are into technology and into fiber optic and it, it's a very interesting business. It's a very unique process. Um, 
But I looked at that one, that, that specific individual. I, I grew up with this guy, literally, right? 30 years. Um, and I said, how did we let him down? You know, we let him down. And, and when I participated in his exit interview as part of the security protocol, then he said, you know, this is a problem I've had for my entire life. I mean, he was a valued contributor um, and the random, but what we were doing never got it to the point where he said, I need to deal with this issue. I'm fully functioning, I do my job, I get great reviews at work, but ultimately we lost that value asset um, at a time when we couldn't afford to lose 30 year trained employees. Um, and that's really what drove the significance of us to say, we need to get more aggressive, not in the testing component, that's a corporate policy. How do we make sure that we don't get that 30 year guy to the finish line and have no way to, to, to help him? Um, how do we get our information about EAP? How do we focus more on those key indicators so that we can open up the conversation, open up the door, and then then that conversation can take towards that EAP and that reminder that you know this we, we need to actively work this program because the random screen is what it is. If you get caught in it, there's no safety net. There's no there's no going back. There's no undo. Um, there's no do over. Um, and we lost a few employees, and th this one gentleman in particular, um, one of our highest paid slots, very valued contributor. Um, when the name was on the list, we all looked at the list and we were like. Oh my God, what are we gonna do? You know, I mean, how, how did this happen? How did we get here and not know something, right? And I think as we unraveled it, we talked with supervisors, we talked with this manager, there were little, there were things that we should have been able to key on to kind of draw the conversation in a, in a productive direction. We just, hey, he was always on time, he came to work, and you know, we just you get caught up in you know, 100% capacity production and uh, hiring new employees, you, 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 you gotta stay focused on that, those small key indicators and follow up on it. I really, really appreciate that perspective. I, I as all of us who are um, either supervisors or employers, um, there has to be a lot resonating about do I see patterns that I, have I just simply asked the question, how you doing? The question isn't set up to, for somebody to have somebody deny and say no. The question is set up to have somebody talk. So John, when you and I talked about this concept of prevention and intervention as a link to retention, John had a very interesting perspective on the whole concept of the disease model. Please. So, well first let me say that you know the CEO that I talked about earlier, I, although I didn't know he'd be supportive, he was. In fact, um, once I did sit down with him and tell him kind of the struggles I was going through with my daughter, he looked at me and he said, the answer is always yes. Don't have to call me, you don't even have to get the answer. It's just yes, if you need to go, if you need to do something, just do it and let me know what's going on after the fact if that's what needs to happen. But he's like, the answer is always yes when it comes to your daughter. To the point that he actually had an administrative assistant that he connected me with probably within three months of our first conversation. He said, John, can you do me a favor and talk to my administrative assistant? I think she's struggling with some of the same issues and her daughter was, was struggling with heroin addiction as well, and I ended up actually connecting her daughter and getting her into treatment. Um, so, and me and her are still friends to this day, as, as are me and that CEO, but there was a tremendous amount of loyalty, needless to say, after we communicated, and re I realized that he had my back with whatever it looked like. Um, not to mention the load it took off from a stress thing, but I think one of the things I've encountered when you look at the employment world and you look at um, employers is, and just in the public in general, is is the disease model can be really polarizing. There's not everybody agrees with it, um, and I think what's important to recognize is that regardless of whether we look at it as a disease, as an employer or not, and whether people agree, it doesn't matter. It's it's a health problem. It's affecting bottom line, and it's about helping people. So I think when we can get away from that that one label and and hone in on the fact that it's a health problem if we can support and have a supportive environment in the workplace, we can start addressing the issues and you don't have to agree with the language or whether it's a disease or we can get away from that and, and create a more supportive workforce 
which is just going to increase profitability for the employer. It's going to have you're going to have much more loyalty with your employees, <coughs> and you're going to be able to create a workplace place with with tremendous. I mean, the, the thought of when I finally did leave that employer, it was not an easy thing because he was so supportive of me, and that was that was a huge thing for me, and, and I think for him, and my productivity was much stronger as a result of of that support. So I think. Um, whether you're an employer or an employer looking at it from that viewpoint of creating that workplace that and embraces it and is willing to address it and support it, you can you can create a much more um, a much a much safer place that will will have a lot of long term benefits, um, not only from just a helping people standpoint, which is the most important, but from a profitability standpoint. I think I think we lose sight of that. Thank you so much, John. You know, one of the things that um, I, I, I appreciate um, that I think starts to tee up is that um, Chris and Rob and John have talked about culture. There's no doubt. Remember the whole saying that um, culture eats vision for lunch? Culture, culture, culture. And I think you're really saying a lot about this in this conversation. We've talked about intervention. We've talked about um, prevention. We talked about re retention, but Chris brought up um, in our conversation that business has a significant role in long-term recovery, and I thought, geez, if businesses buy that, you know, you can sell snow to, uh, snow to Eskimos, because the idea that I own long-term recovery as a business owner, <coughs> that, that might be something to swallow. Can you talk about that? Well, you, first of all, I, you know, this is a, you know, substance abuse, mental health issue. But I'm also a business owner. I understand business. I understand that businesses are in business for profitability standpoint. And so what I'm bringing to the table for them is, yes, I'm asking you to think differently. I'm asking you to, uh, to, to embrace what these guys are saying and understand that if you show to your staff member that you truly do care about them as a person, it is going to reap a lot of benefits for you as a business owner. And it's a continuum. We need to talk about prevention. We need to talk about intervention and also access to treatment if it's uh, necessary. But then it's comprehensive, and that also includes recovery. Uh, I, from a business perspective, and also as somebody that works in this field, I know the work that people in recovery put into being in recovery. They have painstakingly uh, self-assessed their lives. They have uh, gone to uh, help and developed skills and they have become a better person because of uh, their addiction and their mental health issues. And that's just, I just described to you what a good employee is. <laughs> and um, I, I think that, you know, knowing that the best thing that we can do for people with this issue is to help them connect the opposite of addiction is connection, and that uh, any time that we can be supportive and, and help them in their recovery, it's going to uh, be really good for us. I know when I'm out there uh, drug testing people, and a lot of people identify themselves to me as somebody in long-term recovery, and they're really good people. No. There are some, you know, Chris and I have had this conversation many times, um, and his points are valid. I, I, I agree with a lot of his points. Um, Obviously, when you're in a big corporate structure, you have certain policies that are mandated by corporate. Um, and so our focus on was how do we get that communication up front so we're not at the random event and now we have no mechanism to recover. Um, we focus more on our supervisory and our frontline managers um, in reference to EAP and the support type training and also generating um, mechanisms to collect those indicators. Um, most organizations will look at a, you, you do an annual review, and you have a mechanism to pull your indicators together at, the, at an annual review and assess the employees, how did they do this year? How are we going to adjust pay? How are we going to reward this employee for their performance? Well, when you're doing random processing all through the year, if you wait till the end of the year to address a key metric, it's too late because that person's going to get caught in the net somewhere. 
Um, so we had to dis change our philosophy is how we collect those metrics and how we provide the supervisor and the manager some sort of an informational flow that looks at whether it's be attendance, whether it's be productivity, scrap rates, things that happen on a weekly basis to help them look at trends, mm -hmm. to help them look at patterns, to help them look at individuals so that they can have those coaching kind of conversations early um, before you get to an annual event or before the capture at, at a random screen. Um, you know, I, I wanted to uh, just mention a little bit um, some of your comments, Lori, about people being concerned about addressing these issues with the boss and job and the comments from the panel. Uh, in addition to serving as the director of the Bureau of Drug and Alcohol Services, I'm also a person in long-term recovery. Uh, 28 years sometime next week. And um, exactly. I always remember, uh, I worked for uh, a large Fortune 500 company uh, just off the highway in Somerville, and I can remember wanting or needing to address this issue with my boss, and I'm driving down 93, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to her about it, and I'm not going to talk to her, maybe I'll talk to her about it tomorrow. And, and, uh, and I got into the office, and I saw her, and I just said it. <laughs> and, and the reason that just pushed me over the line is because I knew that she cared about the people that worked for her. I knew that the, the company had policies that allowed for treatment and also had health insurance that covered it. And so that was critically important for me being able to find my way to recovery. Uh, I, you know, I want to tell you a little bit. Uh, about what the state is doing, and, and we know the costs of um, the terrible opioid epidemic that uh, emergency department visits for uh, overdose have doubled. We know that naloxone administrations, uh, medication for reversing drug overdose deaths have tripled from 900 admissions per year in 2012 to 2,700 uh, admissions uh, last year. Uh, we know that a little over a decade ago, there were 440 drug overdose deaths in the state. Uh, last year, there were 439. Uh, we're on par for exceeding that number this year. They're projecting 488. And so th there's been a devastating impact. Chris talked a little bit about the Polycon study, you know, over $2 billion cost to the state, over a billion of that's related to um, business loss to um, absenteeism and lost productivity. And so um, I want to tell you a little bit about what the state's doing. And the state is putting forth, a, uh, there's a governor's commission that, that includes most of the state agency heads and many representatives from a number of different groups, so the Medical Society, Higher Ed, Business and Industries Association. Uh, and the charge of that, that commission by statute is to develop a plan for the state to address the misuse of alcohol and drugs. And that's a, it's a plan, it's a comprehensive approach. And so, you know, you often hear about treatment, we need treatment, we need treatment, we absolutely do need treatment. But that's a little like um, closing the barn door after the horse has gotten out. So our, our strategies really look to uh, address these issues much earlier on. We, we have population level strategies that are things like uh, laws and regulations. We know the prescribing, over-prescribing of opioids is partly what got us here. So prescription drug monitoring programs, public awareness programs <coughs> that let people know about the risks associated with the misuse of alcohol and drugs, um, penalties for trafficking and distribution, all of those kinds of things. And then we have prevention services, a lot of them in schools, that target individuals that we know are at particular risk. So you know, kids that are coming from homes there's active mental health or addiction or people with a history of trauma, uh, kids that are involved, uh, poor academic performance at school or involved with the criminal justice system, we're all at greater risk so we can target those individuals. Early intervention services for people that are misusing but not yet addicted, crisis intervention services, uh, we have a crisis, statewide crisis line now, and regional access point services including with Granite Pathways to facilitate people in crisis getting services, and of course, uh, treatment and recovery support services, which are absolutely critical. And the state's put 
an unprecedented amount of resources out in all of these areas, $27 million last mm -hmm. year, which for us is uh, amazing. And I, I want to let people know that embedded in this strategy, there's also a fiscal benefit. We know that the better the outcomes earlier on with these population level strategies and prevention, early intervention, uh, will prevent people for, from progressing uh, <coughs> through misuse and addiction, which with every level, it gets more and more costly to provide those services. And it's those individuals that are wrecking havoc on the criminal justice system, child welfare and business and so on. So, um, so we really appreciate, and there's an important role for businesses. You've heard here today all the things that businesses can do in your companies. But I want to, to invite you to consider kind of the good citizen approach. And, and we've had business owners approach us about this. What can we do? What can we do to help our community? And so we have regional public health networks, and in those networks, uh, they try to engage members of the healthcare and education and law enforcement and um, and business community. And so we desperately need business members of the business yeah. community to be involved in our efforts. A, a big problem with putting all of this funding out there is the challenges to communities to actually develop the programs and hire the staff to build these programs to provide these services. There could be a lot, a great benefit to their efforts with leaders from the business community that have the knowledge and expertise and, and kind of the movers and shakers that have that inter entrepreneurial approach to yeah. being able to pull these things off. So we need you. And so uh, I would encourage you to get involved. Matter of fact, we're currently, um, we put some efforts on, in way to better engage the business community uh, through the Bureau of Drug and Alcohol Services working uh, with many of our partners, including New Futures and, and the Public Health Networks, to do a better job engaging the business community. So I appreciate uh, the, the chance to say a few words about what the state is doing, and I applaud your efforts, and thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.